Energy Media readers, we are going to be talking to Dinara Millington from the Canadian Energy Research Institute, one of my favorite, no, I take that back, my favorite think tank because they do excellent work around the uh, topics that we report on. And there's nothing like expert opinion uh, buttressed by data to, uh, to make your point and make your story. So the study today is, uh, they've been, just been released, a study about uh, movement of crude oil by rail, what that means for the industry over the next 10, 20 years. So to discuss that, uh, we'd like to welcome Dinara Millington from Siri. Good afternoon, Markham. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. So uh, Dinara, this crude oil by rail has been a pretty contentious uh, issue because it's more expensive, anywhere from eight to fifteen dollars a barrel more to move it to market, depending on where it's going. And of course, then we've seen when when uh, uh, volumes of crude oil by rail rise, then that creates problems within the rail system and mm -hmm. competition with other commodities. So it, it really is kind of a complex issue. And is is that what you studied, uh, you know, in your report? Thank you. Uh, so uh, just a little bit of background about the study. Uh, we, yes, while the focus was on the crude oil and petrochemical products, uh, we, in order to assess um, the opportunity for these uh, uh, two commodity groupings to be moved uh, by rail in higher volumes, we needed to assess all the other commodities that are currently moved by the Canadian rail system. Uh, and the network that connects the Canadian markets to the US and uh, US markets and Mexico. Uh, so what we found in our analysis, we did, a, um, I guess we parted a little bit of from our traditional forecasting when we do a long term assessment. This one was a bit of a, a medium term. It looked at next five years and what that um, what, what is the scale of the commodities that are being moved and what we found is given given uh, a business as usual conditions uh, when it comes to our economy and the economy uh, worldwide, we found that Canadian rail system will be moving 11% uh, more of commodities that it currently does in, in as comparing to 2018 data. Uh, within that, the petrochemicals and plastics and fuel oils and petroleum, so crude, crude by rail, were identified as the two, one of the two major commodity groupings that would require additional capacity on the rail in order to be shipped to export products or products within our North American continent. Now, uh, one of the conflicts that has come up in the past is between farmers who want to ship canola and wheat and so mm. on. It's a very seasonal kind of business right. and often comes into conflict, uh, you know, demand for locomotives and cars. Is that the other commodity grouping that you were looking at? That's right. So if I were to take a sort of top five commodity groupings that, that we've identified, all of them come from the resource extraction type industries. One of them, the largest grouping is uh, grains that are coming and other agricultural products, uh, coal, um, potash, uh, and, and yes, and crude oil and plastics and chemicals were the other two. So definitely uh, grain is, is, is especially within Western Canada, especially within prairies region of provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, in Manitoba to a certain extent, we definitely see uh, a, a large capacity that is being taken up by that commodity grouping. Um, what uh, does your study say about the price per barrel shipped? I, you know, if it's between uh, say eight and $15 now, it's quite a bit higher than, than pipelines. And mm -hmm. so industry is always saying we need mm -hmm. pipelines instead of rail. What's, what's your study right. take on that? So we, we didn't directly assess the cost of moving crude by rail, uh, but uh, given, the, given the ongoing um, opposition and delay in constructing new uh, pipeline expert capacity out of Western Canada, we did do a scenario-based assessment of what would happen if the three additional new pipelines were not built. And by the three pipelines, I mean, the refurbishment of the line three on the main line system, the expansion of the Trans Mountain system, and the built out of the Keystone Excel. And so, what we found is, without those without those pipelines, um, we will see crude by rail increase from the current level of about 300,000 barrels per day to almost a million and a half. 
by the end of our forecast period. Uh, however, as you, what other scenarios looked at, as you add additional capacity, we're seeing significant drop off um, uh, on crude by rail volumes. And that is exactly back to your point. It all uh, comes down to the economics of moving crude by pipeline versus rail. And rail is still to this day uh, um, a more expensive option for, for moving crude oil out of Western Canada than the pipeline would be. So I would assume that the, um, in order, in any of the scenarios that you looked at, I mean, if, if, if uh, crude oil by rail and petrochemicals and so on is expanding, that means investments, significant investments mm -hmm. in the rail system itself. So what did you find there? Correct. So we did part of our assessment, uh, not only look at the physical flows of the various commodities, we, we wanted to understand what is the financial outlay would be in order to accommodate this increased uh, uh, volumes. So what we found is, yes, additional investment would be required, uh, not just, the, just on the rail, um, rail system itself, but all the additional supporting supply chain links like terminals, yards, ports, um, and other uh, uh, short, line short line railway companies, all in all, uh, the total overall investment uh, dollars, what we're seeing is increasing from about two and a half billion dollars in 2019 to almost five billion dollars by the end of the forecast period. Um, it is significant, a chunk of, uh, chunk of investment, but that would be required in order to move the, the forecasted volumes that we predict. Majority of that investment, more than 50% of that would be to accommodate additional physical track. Uh, so this would be the, 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 you know, the actual metal that needs to go down on, on, on the ground. But then the other half is spent on expanding capacities in terminals and ports and such to, to, to accommodate the additional capacity. Um, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you look at a scenario where the three pipelines didn't get built and that would add mm. a lot of capacity. Uh, shipping capacity required, but under a sort of uh, you know a, a business as usual scenario where you mm -hmm. see some growth over incremental growth over time, what does that look like? So our baseline scenario actually assumes that all three pipelines are built, and in that scenario, we're seeing crude by rail go, growing from about 280,000 barrels per day in 2018 to about 360,000 barrels per day by 2025. So not, 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 there is still an increase, but not as significant as a million and a half if those pipelines were not built. I don't know if your study looked at this, but I've been very interested in and done a, a bit of reporting on the mm. uh, Gibson Energy's uh, diluent recovery unit, which right. is going to take something like 90, 95% of the diluent out of uh, Dilbit and mm -hmm. then ship heated uh, bitumen in rail cars down to uh, the Gulf, U.S. Gulf Coast, and what really caught my eye was the company claims that when you don't have 30% diluent in the rail car, that brings down the cost per unit very close or at least competitive with pipelines. Would an innovation like that change your uh, assumptions radically, or would that just be an incremental issue? So two things with that, uh, with the recovery of diluent and the ability to ship bitumen as a rail bit, uh, which basically means uh, uh, zero to very little amount of, of diluent, two things there are the cost, that's correct, the cost of your crude by rail shipments will decrease, um, probably be equivalent to what you would ship a dill bit on the pipeline down from, from Western Canada to, to, the, to the Gulf, not necessarily other markets. Um, and then second one is capacity. So with pipeline, you, you would have to have a, a, such a liquid product that meets the pipeline spec. Whereas with rail, it's a little bit more flexible. If we can ship bitumen without diluent, we can in increase the amount of, of, of bitumen we are actually shipping. Uh, and so if you incorporate that into the cost and overall cost of transportation, then yeah, I would say they'll probably be on par of shipping conventional heavy or dill bit type product on the pipeline down to the Gulf of Mexico. Well, it's fascinating. We're going to be watching this with some interest over the next mm -hmm. year or two as producers and, and uh, the midstream sector grapple with getting product to market and who knows what happens after the pandemic is over, if it ever ends. Uh, right. So 
Dinara, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. I'll appreciate your good work as always. And we'll be, I'm sure we'll be talking to you in the near future. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. And take care. Stay healthy.